honored to be your speaker tonight. My youngest daughter is named Alexa. A few years ago, Alexa was head cheerleader, valedictorian, and class president in the third grade. And um, <laughs> Bob, you're right. This is a sharp group. Uh, you know, I cleared that with Bob earlier. I said, yeah, it's a little late in the evening. And he said, no, no, Tennis Congress, sharp group. Indeed, you're right. And she comes one day, and she says, Daddy, Daddy, I'm so excited. I've already talked to my teacher. I want you to come and speak at my school during an assembly. Well, as I'm sure all of you can imagine, I was so touched that my precious little girl would want me to come and visit her school. So I thought it was appropriate that we would sit down and we would talk about the day. I said, honey, do you realize that if I stand in front of all the boys and girls, they're going to know about your daddy's hands and about his legs. Now, now, sweetie, I just want to make sure that you feel comfortable with that. I'll never forget what she said. Daddy, you were born to be an inspirational speaker. <laughs> I mean, it just touched my heart. I said, honey, that's such a nice thing to say. And then she explained. She said, yeah, daddy, you got a peace sign in one hand, a thumbs up on the other. <laughs> that's a great way to explain it. The physical challenge that I have affects all four of my limbs, from the elbows down and from the knees down. As Bob mentions introduction, I said, you know, everybody faces challenges. Some you can see and some you can't. Probably wondering if having three fingers and short arms affects my life today. Yes, it does. With selfies. <laughs> I stretch out as far as I can, all I get, mugshot. You know, PJ, you were right. This is such a fabulous, fabulous resort. Um, I really wish my wife could have, uh, could have been with me. Uh, her name's Catherine. I should tell you that we were high school sweethearts, uh, except she didn't know it. And um, <laughs> every so often she accompanies me on speaking engagements. Of course, I'll introduce her. And a couple of times, an audience member has said to her, uh, Hey, Catherine, just listen to your husband speak. What's it like being married to such a positive guy? And I love her response. We don't let Roger speak at home. <laughs> There's a lot of truth to that. Um, I have three toes on my right foot and a partially developed lower right leg. And I was unable to walk until I was five years old. You know, I can remember this experience very vividly even today. I used to sit outside on my parents' front porch and I'd watch all the neighborhood children play outside. And as I'm sure all of you in this room can imagine, I so desperately wanted to be like them. I, you know, I wanted to have normal hands and normal legs. And of course, there were times I would get discouraged. And it was then that I would turn to my mom, wisest person I know. I remember asking her mom, why was I born this way? And she used to tell me, well, honey, it's because you're not a carbon copy, you're an original. Those are good words. Kind of ties into what you said, Bob, about need to improve, not prove. Boy, isn't that true? And then I had to ask my mom the most difficult question of all, why do kids tease me? This is what she used to tell me. Roger, that's just a weak person's imitation of strength. I had an audience member approach me and say, you know, Roger Crawford, that quote that you attributed to your mother, I think Eleanor Roosevelt said that. <laughs> I said, really? Well, I'm shocked. Eleanor Roosevelt was former first lady of the United States. Can't believe that she would steal that quote from my mom. <laughs> <laughs> my mom was my hero. In fact, <laughs> I can remember being on the playground. I bet a lot of you have had this experience. You know, the kids say something like this. Hey, my daddy can beat up your daddy. And I used to look at them and say, that's no big deal. My mom can whip him too. <laughs> my parents instilled possibility thinking in my life at a very young age. Now, possibility thinking as I see it means for all of us in this room, I mean, we come from diverse backgrounds. Of course, we have the commonality of the love of tennis, 
the passion for this great game. And as we heard from Raphael, and I bet we could go around this room and hear very similar stories about how the game of tennis has changed our lives. But I think you'd agree that our lives and our work are ultimately defined by what we choose to dwell on, we focus on. Focus on the opportunities in life or the obstacles, problems or the possibilities. I mean, I can imagine, PJ, when you had this wonderful idea, this wonderful vision of the Tennis Congress, I'm sure there are a few obstacles that you could tell us about. There are a few problems. But you had a laser-like focus on possibilities, on vision, and you see the result. My parents believed that someday I'd be able to walk, and they found a doctor named Robert Weeks, who amputated the bottom part of my left leg, then reconstructed my knee. So this evening, I'm wearing an artificial leg or prosthesis. When Bob introduced me, he mentioned that I often say in my presentations that challenges are inevitable, but defeat is optional. I believe that the greatest resource that we have in our lives, and I know you're going to be talking about this a great deal over the next 72 hours, is this. The greatest resource that we have is our mindset. It's our ability to choose our attitude. It is volitional. And here's why I think it is so crucial. Think about this for a moment. You very rarely, if ever, perform better than you believe you can. That's how powerful our beliefs are, because our beliefs drive our behaviors, and our behaviors determine our results. Simply put, the better that we choose to think, the better results we get. All of us have had this experience that if our belief system says something is impossible, we will then look for evidence in our lives to support that negative mindset. In the same respect, if you believe that something is possible, something is attainable, again, you will look for evidence that will support that optimistic view. Here's what I've experienced in my life, and I bet you've experienced it in yours as well. You know, real handicaps like mine, they, they can be overcome. But it's the imaginary ones that really disable us. You know, PJ, when I walked in here this evening and I saw this slide, I was inspired by those two words, reach higher. And I thought about how relevant that was in my life and how those two, two words really shaped the direction of my life. Because there was a period of time where I felt that I was defined by my circumstances. You know, Raphael, for example, in your life, you talked about battling weight. I'm sure there were times that you felt overwhelmed by that circumstance, and I, I get that because well, I, I just couldn't find the courage to take my hands out of my pockets. I was so gripped with anxiety. So I got a new pair of hands. They were perfect. Everything I had dreamed of. Nice long fingers. Now my first observation when I put these hands on was, what do people do with ten fingers? I'm poking myself in the eye and everything. <laughs> I, I just got to tell I think 10 fingers, it's a bit of a waste. I got to tell you, it really is. <laughs> but, but, but see, my mindset was that my life was determined by my circumstances. But we've all had that experience that that's not true. We can overcome, we can transcend circumstances, and it begins with our belief system. But I removed my hands. Still couldn't find the courage to take my hands out of my pockets until I had a coach say these words to me. Roger Crawford, you will never reach higher with your hands in your pockets. I was so inspired by those words, I got involved in track and field, and I learned how to throw the javelin. Well, I have to admit to all of you, when I threw the javelin, I didn't set many records. But I certainly kept the crowd alert. <laughs> when I was backing up, everybody was backing up when I started to throw the javelin. But you know, to begin this Congress, I cannot think of two better words. Reach higher. See, that's what I've learned from people like yourselves. See, peak performers, let's use a tennis analogy. 
for a moment. Peak performers always play up. In other words, they're always committed to continuous, ongoing improvement. They are perpetual students. And you know what? As I stand in front of this group, I'm speaking to an audience that have already embraced that principle. You know how I can say that with full confidence? You're here. You're here. So that shows your commitment to reach higher. You see, my friends, if we embrace those two words, reach higher, we never let acceptable get in the way of exceptional. And what I've learned from peak performers, people like yourselves, what I've learned from, from champions is they are never complacent. They are always looking for ways that they can grow, that they can expand their capacity. I have a relative of mine who has really reached the pinnacle of excellence. And when PJ asked me to be here at the Tennis Congress, I thought, you know, this might serve as inspiration for all of you as, as you begin this 72 hours. Um, she's a world champion. I have a picture of her. If you could bring that up, please. There she is. World champion. Her name, Judy Allen. She's in the International Skeet Shooting Hall of Fame. In fact, it's in San Antonio, Texas. If you walked into the Hall of Fame, you would see her picture. And at the bottom, there's this plaque. It says, Modern Day Annie Oakley, greatest female skeet shooter in history. That person is my mother-in-law. Think about that, Jeff. That's scary. <laughs> right? Mother-in-law. Look at that picture. <laughs> if you could take that picture down, I'd appreciate it. I, uh, I got her here on this screen and behind me. It's a little intimidating, I'll tell you. So, right. So think about this. I mean, all of us could agree that, you know, we have tremendous respect for anybody who, who can reach that pinnacle, right? So very few people can do that. And to, to have somebody who's a, a relative of mine, somebody that I can talk to about this, I'm so excited because I just wanted to learn from her. So I said, Judy, how do you become a world champion? How do you become the very best? She looked at me and she said, practice when you want to. And I thought, well, that makes sense. Practice when you want to. And then she said this. Practice when you don't want to. <laughs> she said, practice when you don't feel like it. Practice when the circumstances are not perfect. She said, because if you do that, if you have that mindset, you'll always be ready when you call for your target. In the International Ski Shooting Hall of Fame, they have one of the rifles that she used. And if you looked at it, you would notice there's something carved on the end of the gun. 1MS. One more shot. She told me whenever she felt like giving up, she'd always look as, at it, as a symbol. One more shot. One more time. Practice when you want to practice when you don't want to. So let's talk a moment about this great sport of tennis. We were talking earlier about this at dinner. I, uh, I, I speak to a variety of groups and it's always just such a rare opportunity that I get to stand in front of a group of tennis enthusiasts. It's such a tremendous honor. I, uh, Joel Drucker is a good buddy of mine. I know we played tennis together and uh, known each other for quite some time. And uh, so it's just such a rare treat for me to, to, to be here tonight and talk about this game that Raphael, to your point, changed my life. It took what a lot of people said was a disability, and you know what tennis did? Turned into a possibility. Uh, now, you're probably wondering, okay, Roger, really, how well do you play tennis? Well, the great Barry McKay, a lot of you remember, remember that name. He was a tennis pro in San Francisco, and uh, he made it possible for me to hit a few balls with John McEnroe. So I got to play John McEnroe. Yeah, let me tell you what I learned from that experience. Positive attitude doesn't work every time. 
That's what I learned. So we relocated from Ohio to California. I was very shy and reticent. Struggled so mightily taking my hands out of my pockets. I had very, very few friends, and I spent a lot of time by myself. But across the street from our home were four tennis courts. The club was called Greenbrook, just a community club, and they had a backboard. And I used to hear that backboard being used. I can still hear that sound today. And I thought, gosh, I'd love to play tennis. So I started off with a wood racket. And I laid it against my right arm, and then I basically would hold the racket in that manner. The problem was, if I swung really hard, the racket would come out of my hands. Knocked out a couple of opponents and ran out of people to play with. <laughs> and what happened next, some people say it was coincidence. I think it was providence. I walked into a tennis store, and what did I see? this gorgeous racket. It was like the Holy Grail. In fact, we have a picture of the racket. We could bring that up. How many of you remember that racket, right? Well, I'm convinced that Wilson made that racket for me. I'm going to tell you why. Because I picked up that racket, and my right finger slipped in between those two parallel bars. It was like Cinderella trying on a slipper. <laughs> it was perfect. And that's how I learned how to hold on to the racket. Having my right finger in between those two bars allowed me to secure the racket. Today, I no longer use the Wilson T2000. I use another racket, but I still have that same space, and we have a picture of that, if you could bring that up. So that's how I hold the racket today. Now, when I was playing tennis, having an artificial leg, you know, I certainly wasn't the fastest. Although, you know, I could get around fairly well on the tennis court with my artificial leg and having three toes on, on one foot. In fact, I remember playing this gentleman one time, and throughout the entire match, I wear long warm-up pants. He doesn't realize until the match is over that I wore an artificial leg. He took the loss a lot harder then, I'll tell you that. <laughs> you know, I wasn't the fastest, I wasn't the most powerful. You know, Bob mentioned I played at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. And, you know, I was a decent, decent college player. I certainly wasn't the best on my team. But you know what I learned playing tennis? And I was thinking about Raphael as you talked about this, and so did you, Bob, and, and PJ. Very, very, you articulated this very, very well about the lessons that you learn, right, on the tennis court can shape our entire life. And gosh, that's so true. Because what I learned on the court, if you can hit the ball over the net one more time than the other person, you win the point. And isn't that true in our lives as well? See, something that I talk to groups about is this. Consistency is much more important than perfection. It's hitting that ball over the net. I mean, that is a great, great life principle that we can apply in all areas of our lives. You know, the other principle that I learned playing tennis was the difference between fear and anxiety. Fear is tied to something real. In fact, if you look up at the definition of fear, here's what it says. A reasonable and understandable response to our circumstances. So what that tells me is if we are committed to reach higher, that means we're going to have to leave the known and enter into the unknown. And if we do that, by definition, it seems that we're going to experience a little bit of fear. In fact, if we went around this room and you started talking about circumstances in your life, and we talked about times that you have taken a risk, entered into an area of uncertainty, I bet every one of, the, every one of you in this room would say, and you know what? I experienced a little bit of fear. 
So as we begin this Tennis Congress, something I'll share with you is if you're going to step out of your comfort zone, it's OK to feel a little bit of fear. Fear is a great indication of growth. It is a great indication of taking risk. And a lot of us want to pass up risk in life, sure. But you know what's interesting about that? You pass up risk in life, you pass up opportunity. They kind of go hand in hand. But anxiety, anxiety is one of those limitations you can't see, ones that are self-imposed. Here's the definition of anxiety. The anticipation of a negative event, whether it occurs or not. It goes on to say that anxiety is the negative use of mental rehearsal. When we experience change, Bob, you talked about change, which is also inevitable in life. If you experience anxiety in the midst of change, you're going to look at changes. That's something wrong. But if you experience fear, you can look at change and say, that's something new. Fear versus anxiety. I remember when our daughter Alexa was born. Alexa's my only biological child, and my wife and I knew that there was a 50-50 chance that any child we have would have limbs similar to mine. As an objective self-observer, that's really what I had to do. I had to look at my hands and ask this difficult question. If I had to live my life all over again, would I change my hands or my legs? And the answer I come up with is no. No. Challenges have so many positives in our life. They teach us compassion and gratitude and, and empathy. They grow, as I mentioned, our, our capacity, our ability to manage life. My hands limited my life? Sure, I'm a lousy piano player. <laughs> Tried riding a motorcycle, couldn't apply the brakes. Rode around all day, finally ran out of gas. I mean, that's just things happen. <laughs> but I was there when Alexa was born, and there was fear. I also counted the fingers and toes. One, two, three, four, five. Hands and her feet were perfect. They said, your daughter is nine pounds, seven ounces, 22 and one half inches long. I said, my gosh, we prayed too hard. That's a big baby. <laughs> you know, my, my wife and I have, um, have four children. My wife had three children when, when we got married, and uh, they've embraced me as their dad. And, you know, as I, I watch them grow up, they, gave you, they give you such a great perspective on time. It's like someone hit the fast forward button on your life. When I watch my kids, that's something I think about. And you know, Raphael, you said something, and I, I, I have to tell you, I loved your story. I'm very inspired by what you had to say. And you used this term. You said, I want to pay it forward. I've got a good friend of mine. His name's Art Holst. He's 94 years of age. And he has aged so elegantly and has such zest for life. And I ask him, How's that, how has that been possible for you? You know what he said? Be a re-gifter. And I thought, well, that's a Seinfeld episode. Do you remember the story? You know, that someone gives you a gift, right? And, and you know, give you like a toaster, right? And you don't like the toaster, so you give it to somebody else. And so you're a regifter, right? And then he explained, he said, no, no. He said, what I mean is, we've all been given unique and special gifts. And we don't want to hang on to them, right? We want to give them to other people, be a regifter. That's what you were talking about, about, about paying it forward. You know what I love about that? That spirit permeates this entire room. About each other wanting to reach out and encourage, uplift, and help others reach higher. See, it's so easy, isn't it, in life to, to think that prominence is so important. You know, but prominence is all about us. The spotlight's on us. 
It's about our accomplishments and what we've done. But you know, we've all had the experience of that being very unfulfilling. I had someone ask me this question the other day, what do you want written on your tombstone? I thought about that. Hmm. What do I want written on my tombstone? Here it is. I'd rather be playing tennis. <laughs> That's what I want on mine. PJ, that line worked pretty good. I got to use that in other speeches. That was good. I, I, I tried that out on him a little bit earlier. But what I would hope would be on the tombstone is that hopefully I regifted, paid it forward, which is the spirit that you talk so beautifully about today. That, my friends, is Lanyap. Lanyap. When PJ and I were talking the phone and he told me about how the Tennis Congress had started, and then I talked to, to Joel Drucker and he told me about his participation. I was so excited to be here and I thought, what message? What, what is something I, I would really want to leave you with as you launch into these fantastic days? You know, my contribution is a small part of what I know is going to be such an amazing time for all of you. And I thought about the word lanyap. It's a French Cajun word. I became aware of the word lanyap when I was doing some shopping in southern Louisiana. I was looking at the men's suits. They had 42 regular, 42 long, and 42 short. They didn't have my size. I wore a 42 strange. <laughs> That's a hard size to find. But I'm, nevertheless, I'm still looking at the suits. This gentleman approaches me. Sir, hi, I noticed you were looking at the suits. I'm hoping I might assist you in some way in finding just the right suit for you. I was so impressed, I said, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it, but I got to, I'm not buying a suit today. I said, yeah, I live in California. I'm here in Louisiana on business. And he said, well, we have a very nice selection. I said, no, no, I understand that. I said, but here's the real reason. It's the alterations. You know, my arms are shorter than normal, and same with my legs. And You know, you have to alter the jacket here and there. And, you know, because of that, I just don't think that I'll be buying a suit, but I want to thank you so much for your help. Here's what he said next. Sir, I'm sure you're aware that most athletic men have that problem. <laughs> I like this guy. <laughs> I really did. I said, could you repeat that one more time? Just to make sure I heard you clearly. <laughs> he said, when you have an athletic build, like you obviously do, it's going to require alteration for that suit to fit proper. I looked at him, I said, you're absolutely right. <laughs> I said, I got a few moments, let's just try on a couple of jackets. So I'm looking in the mirror, the arms are a little long. So I think, should I purchase a suit or shouldn't I? Finally I thought, I don't need to put pressure on myself in making this decision. I just need to consult with him. Because it's not every day that you work with an expert in athletic men clothing. And uh, I said, is this the type of suit that an athletic guy like me should be wearing? He said, oh, yes, sir. And there are several others here in the rack that you must have as well. I don't have to tell you I bought them all. Diller's department store in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, has a sign that says, we never neglect the lanyard. A lot of you are probably curious how to spell the word lanyap. So uh, I have a card for every one of you if you'd like one, and how to spell the word lanyap. So when I saw this word, I wasn't familiar with it, but he pronounced it. And I said, I've heard that word before, but I never knew what it meant. And he said, well, it's French Cajun. He said, here's an example. And he said, well, if you walked into a place of business and the customer said to the merchant, I'd like two pounds of grain. The merchant then, of course, would take uh, maybe a burlap sack and a scoop and scoop out of the barrel, then in the burlap sack. Out of the barrel, then the burlap sack. Now, the scale registers two pounds. That was the expectation. But then the merchant takes the scoop one more time into the barrel. And as he or she is pouring it, they say, now here is a little lanyap. The definition beyond full measure. It means a little extra. So my friends, I'd like you to look at Lanyap from two different angles.
number one, be someone who approaches these next seven, two hours with Lanyap. Be all in, all in. Get that little extra, soak it all in, as Bob said. Go ahead and drink out of that fire hose. Give it all you have and a little extra. Number two, be that lanyap for other people. Be that one that gives that little extra, the extra pat on the back, the extra encouragement. That's the spirit of what this organization is founded on. That's how PJ started it, regifting, giving back. I've been a coach for the Special Olympics. One of my athletes is named Emily. Emily has Down syndrome. I just love her dearly. She's a remarkable, remarkable person. I remember the first time I met her, she's looking at her hands, looking at mine, looking at hers, looking at mine. Finally, she thought, this dude needs a little encouragement. <laughs> she says, Roger, I'm handicapped too. Bless her heart. I, I, I was so moved by her words. And I said, thank you, Emily, for sharing that. She said, yep, I had my appendix out last year. <laughs> <laughs> That's great perspective, isn't it? And I saw this Special Olympic event, and I'll never forget it. I, here's something I share with audiences. I, I talk about the power of mental TiVo. And there's those snapshots in our lives, Bob, maybe a story, right? Those snapshots in our life, we got a, DV, we got a DVR. We have to remember those, impact them, let, let them imprint our mind. Mentally DVR, and, and this is an, uh, an, a great example. And I, I was watching the athletes run during this particular race, and I saw one of the athletes fall. And what I saw next was absolutely remarkable. All the other athletes stopped. And they turned around and they ran back and picked that athlete up that had fallen, lifted that person to their feet, and they started to run again. That's Lanya. As Bob mentioned, I'll be up here afterwards if any of you would like to say hello. Um, I want to tell you that if we meet in person, I'm going to reach out and I'm going to shake your hand. I've, uh, a few of you in this audience have heard me speak before at your companies or different functions, and you've heard me say that before. I say that to every group. Always be around afterwards to shake hands with people. And I've had audience members say, now, is that Lanyap? And I say to them, it is. However, it might not be Lanyat in the way that you might be seeing it. In other words, it's the audience me giving me a little extra. It's the audience giving me the gift. Because they allow me to confront my greatest fear. Shaking hands with people. But don't feel badly for me. Used to be an anxiety. Man, I, that's right. <laughs> so, man, I'd avoid it at all cost. Think of the opportunities that pass me by. Why? Because of anxiety. Now, whenever I meet somebody, I reach out and shake their hand. Just want to let you know it's not necessary that you speak loud to me. Common misconception. <laughs> As I thought about what I wanted to leave you all with this evening, I go back to these two words, reach higher. I think they're really profound. Profound in, in embracing them, the incredible impact that it has in our lives. That belief that yes, we can reach a little higher. A few years ago, there was a young couple who after two years of marriage learned they were going to have their first child and they gave birth to a son. Well, there was great anticipation surrounding his birth. It was the first grandchild on either side of the family. But when their son was born, he faced a few challenges. In fact, this couple was told that they would need to prepare themselves to see their son for the first time. 
And this couple told me that when they saw their son, he looked perfectly normal, wrapped in a light blue blanket. And then they unwrapped him and noticed that one of his legs was underdeveloped. His other leg was bent in an awkward position. And when the baby lay down, his leg actually folded underneath him. Well, that little baby that I'm talking about was me. But when I learned that I was going to have the privilege of being here this evening, as we begin this tennis congress, here's what I wanted to bring with me. an Olympic torch. Many people had the honor of carrying it. I was one of hundreds. But I wanted to bring it with me tonight because of the three words that are engraved on this rim. And these three words are really the essence of reach higher. Altius, Sidious, Fortius. Higher, faster, and stronger my wish for you. I look at this torch and it reminds me dreams really do come true. Thanks so much for having me this evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody.